Welcome to the Immigration.ca live stream series. My name is Andrea and I'm here with Colin Singer. Colin is managing partner of Immigration.ca. Immigration.ca is the, uh, the number one Google ranked site and uh, Colin is also managing partner of skilledworker.com. So this is our last live stream of 2017. So it's only appropriate that we do a year in review of 2017. So starting off, what the main one of the main developments really would be the immigration levels. Yeah, under permanent residence, uh, there's just so many developments that happened this year. But uh, perhaps the the, well, the one that stands out the most that that really is. Uh, uh, the highlight of this year is, is our uh, annual immigration level announcements that were made in November. As uh, many people know, uh, the government is, is calling for near one million newcomers coming to Canada uh, over the next three years. Uh, this is a significant development. Uh, previously, uh, the numbers were always in the uh, be before the Liberals came to power. It was always in the range of 250, 260 thousand. With the Liberals, when they came in in 2015. It went up to uh, 300,000, uh, and now there's a, a, a movement towards, uh, after a three-year period going forward, they're looking to have 340,000. So this development on the permanent residence side, the annual levels, was, was quite a, uh, a standalone um, development that's uh, going to have a major impact uh, uh, over the next three years in terms of government policies. Okay. So. Moving on to permanent residence, so I mean obviously that's the main category, uh, and express entry. So the majority of skilled workers have been coming through express entry. So what are some, some, key, some key issues with regards to that? Well, you know, before this year there was a, a, a backlog of applications that uh, had, had been uh, holding over from previous years. Uh, but this year really uh, we saw for the first time under the express entry system almost all the applications uh, are now coming through the federal uh, express entry system. Uh, the government had called uh, for, in 2017, uh, 73,700 um, immigrants coming through uh, the federal uh, system. Uh, that meant uh, a, a significant increase in invitations. Uh, what we've seen no f so far this year, uh, near 90,000 invitations to apply have been issued. That compares to uh, last year there were 33,700 and the previous year to that, 2015, there were 31,000. So we've, we've near tripled uh, previous years uh, with this year's invitations. We're, we're near, near the triple number uh, and, and people would wonder, you know, what, how does that relate? Uh, what, is, what is involved in that uh, number? Uh, what, what really happens is that the number of people who receive an invitation, uh, there's a big drop-off. The government knows this. Uh, there's a really big drop-off that near only 40% of the uh, individuals who receive an invitation will actually perfect their application. So when you do the math, uh, another important component of, of the a whole uh, equation is that there's about 2.1 individuals per application. So when you take a look at the number of 90,000, you quickly do the math, only 40% will actually perfect their application and 40% uh, times 2.1 individuals, you're going to be into the 70,000 range. Uh, so that's, those are the, the key numbers, uh, and we've seen really uh, very important numbers that have come through the system. Uh, we, we had, at the early part of the year, uh, the annual, the, the actual draws were, were near 3,000 per, per draw. And in terms of CRS score... In May, the lowest CRS score of 413. Yeah, we've seen a really... Uh, that, that particular score was, was early in the, in the season. Uh, we, we probably will see the same thing happening, uh, perhaps, uh, coming uh, in the coming year. But, yeah, the lowest CRS score was 413 uh, at the end of May. Uh, and then you had... So you had this really big number of invitations issued in the first quarter. It dropped off in the second. Uh, and then you really had some interesting uh, modifications that happened during the year. Uh, they introduced extra points for French language ability, uh, having a sibling in Canada. Uh, so those numbers had an impact on the CRS scores. And, and I think really what was perhaps another really important 
uh, development in the uh, overall system was they are now able to issue invitations with an exact number, uh, which, which was not the case previously. So you used to see these obscure numbers of invitations issued. Now they're in the 2750 range. This is generally the, the favorite number that we're seeing. We had one earlier uh, this week when 2750 invitations were issued. Uh, what they've introduced is a tie-breaking rule. So they're able to take a look at the time stamp of, a, of when an, uh, an application is submitted to the pool and they're able to now decide, okay, we're going to take 2500 or 2750. I won't be surprised, and I'm not, not going not, not to be sure about this, I won't be surprised if they have one more draw this year. It wouldn't shock me right. if they have one more draw and it's, it's a bigger number of invitations than we've seen this year. It could be the biggest one. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, be, be, uh, don't, don't hold me to it, but it wouldn't shock me if we have one more draw this year with more than 2,750 invitations. So we'll just put it out there and see if that comes to, to play. Um, but again, uh, overall, we've seen tremendous numbers uh, of invitations issued. A lot of our clients received invitations. I mean, that's like we've seen record numbers of invitations issued. Um, so people living overseas, having really uh, decent, good profiles, uh, we've, we've just seen a lot of success this year with uh, a number of, of our clients. Uh, so the interesting as well, uh, in 2018, uh, we've already talked about this, but the, the levels that they're looking to bring in for the skilled uh, worker system would be uh, around 75,000. So it's not going to be a, a dramatic difference from 2017. Uh, it would probably be similar. You're, you'll see bigger number increases in 2019. So we've covered in our previous live streams what uh, is going to take place next year. Uh, but that pretty much summarizes, I would say, uh, the, the Federal Express Entry System. Okay, so we covered Express Entry, so moving on to provincial programs. So our last live stream, we actually covered all the provincial programs. So if you missed that, you can always go to our YouTube channel and you can find it there. But Colin, what are some interesting developments with the provincial programs? So perhaps one of the, uh, well, you know, I, I, Quebec really stands out for me uh, in terms of what it didn't do. Uh, because Quebec brings in about 50,000 people a year. We didn't see any increased numbers this year. We didn't see any, I mean, the government announced early in the year that they would bring in 5,000. We never saw those, those new numbers uh, brought into the mix yet. And, and we're still going to see it. It's just that Quebec operates under a different year system. They, they work uh, end of March is their year end. So we're going to see, very likely, we're going to see uh, 5,000 new uh, applications being admitted into the system between, uh, you know, in the first three months of, of 2018. We didn't see any new numbers in 2017, and, and the reason is really clear. Quebec has very long processing times. They have taken in way too many cases over the years. They were quite... Uh, it, it, it's quite shocking, actually, that Quebec has allowed its system to be compromised so much by allowing such a backlog of applications brought into the system. Uh, the only area we've talked about this in our last live stream was the investor stream, which is they have that perfectly under control. Uh, so Quebec really, uh, the, the, the takeaway from Quebec this year really is the non-economic uh, streams which really is the, the uh, asylum seekers and the refugees. So Quebec made headlines this year for uh, the, the number of uh, individuals who were uh, you know, coming into porous border points uh, mm -hmm. in Canada, which includes a, a, a quite a popular area on the Quebec border uh, with New York State. 
uh, and really uh, the, the numbers are in the thousands of individuals who were coming in uh, through uh, these non-official border points uh, and asylum seekers were, were coming into to Quebec uh, and Quebec was making headlines uh, during the summer they were they were being housed at the uh, Montreal's Olympic Stadium uh, and perhaps another area which which is really quite uh, controversial was Quebec introduced um, a controversial law uh, which will ban uh, face coverings. Uh, that is, is uh, very controversial in that uh, obviously uh, it, it, it violates, uh, according to many, uh, including our views, uh, that it violates uh, most basic charter uh, and, and freedoms uh, and charter arguments. So that is now in the court system. Uh, it, there was a presentation and a hearing was held uh, in uh, November and everyone is waiting for a preliminary decision uh, on whether um, they will uh, be able to temporarily halt uh, the implementation of this law. Um, other than that, Quebec is hoping, we hope, that Quebec will deliver on its plan to bring in uh, more than 50,000 immigrants uh, in 2018. Uh, so that's, that's mostly the Quebec side. Um, Ontario really also is, is, is interesting in that um, they uh, recently concluded a, an important agreement between uh, the province of Ontario and uh, Ottawa, uh, and, and it's going to deal with the harmonization of immigration policies, bringing in, really, Ontario brings in 100,000 immigrants a year, uh, by far and away the most populous province, the most uh, uh, sought after a destination for immigrants coming to Canada. Uh, so under the um, uh, different categories, there's been a, a new category called an employer job offer. Uh, they introduced uh, a new express entry skilled trades stream. Uh, so Ontario is, is really very advanced, very active uh, in the uh, express entry system. Uh, Manitoba had some interesting changes. Uh, they've um, a, introduced an, an international education stream uh, and they revised their business stream. Uh, interesting on the business side is uh, Manitoba is moving, uh, as other provinces on the business immigration side, they're moving to a two-stage uh, system, which means individuals previously used to be able to present an application on a, a planned project on, on, on a, what we would call a, a pre-scripted uh, project a and what the provinces have finally uh, realized is that there's no point in having these uh, scripted um, presentations. Now they're only going to issue individuals a work permit and individuals who are under the business stream will be uh, given an opportunity to deliver on their promise to open a particular business that meets uh, the criteria and only then will they be given an invitation to apply for permanent residence. This is a, a very important development uh, in that most of the provinces are moving towards a two-stage uh, process on the business side and it will uh, significantly alter the landscape on business immigration uh, in that individuals who probably were intending to go to uh, Ontario, British Columbia, Quebec will now be more motivated to actually submit applications in those provinces and they might uh, obviously will not uh, individuals will not use these smaller provinces like Manitoba uh, for a business application where they have no intention of fulfilling those kinds of conditions. So Manitoba, uh, you know, those, those are the hallmarks uh, of the Manitoba. Alberta uh, also was fairly active this year in terms of what they plan to do for, for 2018. Uh, they, they're introducing a new system, uh, a new express entry stream uh, and that replaces the employer-driven uh, stream and the strategic recruitment stream. Uh, so pretty much Alberta, uh, they had 5,500 individuals coming to uh, the province. They filled their quotas uh, earlier this month and um, 
pretty much they're going to uh, continue forward and hopefully uh, we'll see um, higher numbers uh, for, for the province um, in 2018. I think that covers most of, of the important developments uh, on the provincial side of, of permanent residents. Yeah. Uh, caregivers. Uh, well, as a lot of people know, there was a huge backlog with applications, so the government does plan on processing the majority of the backlog in 2018. Well, that's it. Uh, big numbers in the backlog, and that's been a problem for uh, individuals under the caregiver stream. The caregiver stream is, is really, it used to be called the live-in caregiver program. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore. The government uh, removed that and, and abolished it, uh, but there were so many individuals in the stream uh, and in 2016 they you know they're just pulling individuals from a the, the stream had about 80,000 individuals waiting for permanent residence uh, so the government uh, brought in last year 22,000 uh, this year they targeted 18,000 um, individuals uh, and now and that includes applicants and their families uh, and in 2018 uh, the, the plan is to bring in 80% uh, uh, of the remaining uh, backlog. Uh, so individuals who are in that pool uh, have something significant to look forward to. Family class. Very important. In, in October, actually, so the, the age of dependency was actually raised. So instead of being under the age of 19, now if your child is under the age of 22. It's an important change. Obviously, uh, the... Um, uh, the, the realities are many families choose to come to Canada for their children. Right. And so under the previous government, that age of dependency was narrowed significantly. Uh, and what the Liberal government has done is put back the age of dependency to under age 22. Uh, and this is really going to impact a lot of families uh, who were looking to Canada uh, and, and were doing this in order to bring their children, uh, you know, include them in an application. So on the family side, that uh, was a major development. And what about parents and grandparents? Well, parents and grandparents, uh, you know, 2017 was a, a, an interesting uh, development in terms of uh, there was a new lottery system that was introduced earlier this year, uh, very controversial because uh, near 100,000 individuals were applying to get into the system uh, earlier in this year, uh, early in, in, at the beginning of 2017. Out of all of those individuals, uh, a number of, uh, they were supposed to invite uh, nearly um, uh, 10,000, I believe 10,000 uh, invitations were issued, but by the mid of 2017, only 700 individuals were were able to perfect their applications. So this entire system where they've gone through this, we'll call it a charade, I would say, uh, that they've introduced a, a new system awakening the interest of 100,000 individuals who want to apply to bring in their parents and grandparents, uh, all, all for so far 700 or maybe a little bit more now, 700 approximate uh, uh, individuals have now been able to, to take advantage of this program, which is far underperforming uh, for what it was designed to do. Uh, there's going to be uh, another, uh, we're waiting for, for 2018, uh, they're planning to modify the system again. We don't know exactly what will take place. Uh, it's unclear even at this point how many individuals actually received, uh, were able to perfect their applications. Uh, in this current year, but uh, that that's really uh, perhaps uh, one of the um, uh, developments, but not very favorable developments uh, on the permanent resident side for parents and grandparents. I think that brings us to citizenship. Yes, it does. So citizenship, I mean, there were some major developments as well. One of the major ones was a residency requirement. So instead of being present in Canada for four years in a six-year period, it became three years in a five-year period, which significantly you know, increases the time when you can actually apply for citizenship. Well, this is it. You know, Bill C-6 uh, was introduced uh, in, in Parliament uh, in 2016. It took literally more than a year uh, for this bill to actually become a law. It became law this year in June. Uh, and uh, as you said, the most important point about citizenship is, is the uh, qualification period. Um, 
And the other, perhaps another important element of citizenship is that individuals who are now in Canada on temporary status, whether you're studying in Canada or you're working in Canada, you now are able to count up to one full year uh, towards your three years of, uh, uh, of qualification towards citizenship. So uh, individuals who are living in Canada on a, on a study permit uh, or, or on, a, on a working status, uh, you are now able to count up to one full year uh, towards citizenship. Uh, so that means you become a permanent, re you apply for permanent residency and the period of temporary status, uh, that period even before you became a permanent resident will count to some degree up to one full year uh, towards your eventual application for citizenship. Another important element is, is that uh, there's a, of course, there's a knowledge uh, a knowledge and a language test for people who, who are applying for citizenship. Previously, uh, under the older rules, applicants between the ages of, of 14 and 64 had to pass a language and a knowledge test. That is now changed in terms of the age requirements. It's now those between the ages of 18 and 54. Obviously, the difference, I mean, it was very harsh for individuals who were uh, in their 60s having to pass a knowledge and a language test. So the liberals tempered down uh, this, this really uh, controversial requirement, uh, and it's going to certainly benefit uh, so many people. Uh, there are other changes. Again, uh, I would encourage uh, everyone who's uh, sharing with us today to take a look at our website. We've prepared a very extensive document uh, on 2017 year in review, uh, and there are many more changes that took place this year in citizenship, but we've just covered the most important ones. So moving on to temporary workers. So in temporary workers, we had the global talent stream that was introduced earlier this year in June. Uh, I think the most important point about the global talent stream, first of all, it's important for individuals to know it's not a program that you apply into. So if you are a, a, an intending uh, immigrant to Canada, you can't apply into the global talent stream. It's really a tool for large employers, uh, predominantly in the technology field, uh, not only and not exclusively, but it's presently, there's been about 2,000 individuals who have been admitted to Canada. The hallmark of this system uh, under the global talent stream is that it, it really processes individuals in lightning rapid speed. So applications, if you are uh, in the right uh, individual with the uh, proper qualifications, uh, you can get to Canada in literally 10 days. So if you're a, an employer that uh, wants to bring in individuals uh, to Canada, you might be able to take advantage uh, of this new uh, global talent stream, uh, which is uh, part of the uh, temporary foreign worker program overall. Uh, so that, that's the major hallmark of, of that particular uh, new stream uh, that, that was introduced earlier this year. Uh, students? Students. Uh, I guess the, perhaps one of the more important elements about students is that there is now uh, an, a, a transition uh, avenue for, for students who are looking to immigrate to Canada. Uh, you can see uh, a pathway under the Federal Express Entry System, you can now earn uh, significant points uh, if you attend uh, post-secondary education. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a, a push by individual, uh, by the government to bring in, uh, in candidates who, who really have the skill sets to integrate well in Canada. And, and the thinking is, of course, if you've studied in Canada, uh, you have probably the language requirements, uh, you have a professional background, and you have uh, good ties uh, in terms of established relationships and such. So if you're a student looking to go to Canada, this year was very important uh, in that there's new avenues for you to permanently remain uh, in Canada. And perhaps uh, in terms of the numbers of students, well over 400,000 study permits uh, were issued in 2017. Uh, the government, we, we uh, understand, has plans to bring that up 
near 600,000 over the next three years. Uh, so that's really significant. Uh, again, if you're a student in Canada, as I just mentioned earlier, you can qualify for citizenship ultimately uh, by uh, getting credit uh, for your period of study in Canada prior to becoming a permanent resident. So students really uh, have been uh, targeted this year uh, under Canada's uh, immigration policies. Uh, perhaps, you know, we, we covered briefly the refugee stream, um, only mentioned the fact that uh, Canada is bringing in about 40,000, uh, what we call them, you know, in the refugee stream. Uh, so that's a pretty robust number. What the number doesn't take into consideration is the, uh, let's call them irregular uh, asylum seekers that really dominated the headlines this year. Uh, earlier in the year, there was this uh, movement of, of 800 to 1,000 applicants per month coming through Manitoba, coming through uh, the province of Quebec predominantly. We're coming through the, the winter months. Uh, that really peaked during the summer period, uh, June, July. We started to see numbers start to move downwards, really, when the school season started. So you kind of, there's a linkage between September, a precipitous fall in numbers per month of asylum seekers coming through these porous border points uh, and the, the thought is the numbers will increase but not it doesn't seem to be uh, along the same numbers uh, as last year uh, or this current year the reason being the government has made it clear they've put out numbers if you're a, an asylum seeker and you're coming predominantly there a lot of them were from Haiti uh, a lot of these applications were rejected. Most of them are rejected. Uh, so if you're going to go through the pains of coming through uh, a porous border point, um, ultimately the, the numbers show that the chances of success are very low. So you might want to look at other avenues of, of let's call it, more conventional immigration uh, avenues, uh, perhaps the economic streams for those who could qualify, but it's pretty risky. Uh, and and it, it, this, this dominated our headlines earlier in the year, uh, and we're going to wait and see uh, you know, if, if it's going to play out again uh, in 2018. But uh, we have our doubts that it'll be as, um, uh, you know, the numbers will be near the same uh, as they were in 2017. Uh, criminal admi cr sorry, criminal inadmissibility? Yeah, so, you know, the last major development that we wanted to cover today uh, is a really important case that came out uh, in October of this year. The Supreme Court of Canada uh, rendered a, a, an important decision. Uh, it's known as the, uh, the Tran case. Um, and the importance of this case is that uh, serious criminality uh, is, is, is an area, of course, uh, individuals who uh, could be uh, convict, who, who face uh, a sentence of, of more than 10 years when you are involved in a, in a crime that could give rise to a conviction and a prison term of more than 10 years or if you've served at least six months. Now this is for permanent residents of Canada. Uh, if you uh, were convicted of a crime that could give rise to a prison term of more than 10 years or if you've served, if you're going to have a prison term that will put you uh, it, it, for more than six months in prison, uh, that's considered serious criminality under Section 36 1A of our immigration regulations. Now, what happened in this particular case, and that's very important, is that if you have a conditional uh, sentence, which means you don't, you will not be serving prison time, if you have a conditional sentence, that does not fall within the meaning of Section 361A. So it, that's an important development because immigration lawyers, criminal lawyers, uh, can, you know, individuals who've committed a crime uh, will now uh, look to judges 
to try to uh, secure a conditional uh, sentence, uh, which means you would be serving in the community, you might have other uh, attachments to your sentence, but you would not, uh, hopefully not, be put in prison. Now, obviously we're not talking about very serious crimes, but uh, there are crimes that are considered serious under our current rules uh, that uh, give rise to very short prison sentences. Still, they would be considered serious. If you have an attorney that can successfully plead your case and you only get a conditional sentence, which means you serve in the community and other elements, you would not be inadmissible to Canada for permanent residence. So this is a really important case. Um, and uh, for more information on this, we cover this uh, in a nice editorial piece on our website uh, for this month, December uh, 2017 uh, news developments. So that really um, highlights, I think, the most important uh, developments that took place this year. Right. Well, I mean, so, you know, thank you very much for joining us. And if you're interested in coming to Canada, please do go to our website, immigration.ca. You can pl complete our free online assessment. And obviously, if, they want, if you want to read, as Colin mentioned, if you want to read more in detail about what we discussed today, you can go to the new section of our website. You know, I would also, on a closing note, I would say, uh, you know, as we started off earlier in our, in our session, the government is planning to bring in one million newcomers to Canada in the next three years. We certainly urge uh, those that have an interest in Canada, be one of them. Uh, complete an assessment questionnaire uh, that will render, uh, will evaluate for you for free, uh, no charge, uh, and perhaps you might be able to be one of those newcomers uh, coming to Canada uh, over the next uh, next year. Yeah. So and follow us. Follow us, please. Follow us on our social media, and we'll keep you up to date. The next live stream should be January eighteenth. I think we're gonna. Uh, the next date uh, is is the third week in January. Uh, January eighteenth. If it's a Thursday, it's going to be our next live stream. We have something really interesting planned for that particular session. So. So. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and we wish you all a happy holidays. Safe holidays. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon.